Soldiers of the press. This week, a letter to Mrs. Marshall. Oh, Ed, get me the New York office of the United Press on the telephone, will you? You want anybody in particular, Bill? Yeah, get me Ed Williams. He'll be able to tell me where Leo Disher is. Leo Disher is in England, recovering from 15 bullet and shrapnel wounds received while covering the attack on Oran Harbor for the United Press. This is the story of a letter Leo Disher received not long ago and his answer to that letter. Our story begins on December 7th, 1942, one year after our defeat at Pearl Harbor, one month after our victory at Oran, Algeria. In the city room of the Augusta Chronicle in Georgia, an editor put through a telephone call to New York. Hasn't that call to New York gone through yet? Oh, yeah, it's on the pipe now, Bill. Pick it up. Thanks. Hello, that you, Ed? Yeah. This is Bill Morris at the Augusta Chronicle, best newspaper in the state of Georgia. Oh, yeah, that's what you all say down there. Okay, okay, then I'll just skip the sales talk and come to the point. Where can I get hold of Leo Disher? He's in England in a hospital. All right, what's up, Bill? Oh, well, uh, remember that story he filed from Oran? Sure. Nice job of reporting. Uh, you can say that again. It was a grand job. But here's what I'm getting at. One of the men he mentioned in the dispatch was Lieutenant Colonel George Frederick Marshall from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I think I remember. He was the commanding officer of the Army men aboard the cutter that took Disher to Oran. Yeah. Marshall was killed in that action, wasn't that it? That's right. Now, Mrs. Marshall, who lives here in Augusta, was in to see me today. She'd like to have some more information about her husband. You know, how he died. Uh-huh. I thought maybe Disher might be able to give her further details. Think so? Probably. The only thing is, I don't know exactly where he is at the moment. You know how it is. Yeah, I guess you United Press men get around. I'll tell you what, Bill. Have Mrs. Marshall write me a letter, and I'll send it along to Leo. It may take a little while, but sooner or later he'll get it. How does that sound to you? Sounds okay. Fine. A week or so later, United Press staff correspondent Leo Disher in London, England, received a large batch of communications from the New York office of United Press. One of the letters was marked urgent. Open that one first, Harry. Might be a check. <laughs> no one in the memory of man has marked a check urgent. Only the guy that gets them feels that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, little laughing boy. But open it up anyhow. Uh, let's see. Well, it's two letters. One is from the office. Dear Leo, the enclosed letter from Mrs. George Frederick Marshall... Marshall? Uh, yeah. ...is self-explanatory. We know you will want to answer it personally, so we're sending it along to you. Best regards and so on. Let me have Mrs. Marshall's line. There you are. Do you want me to... No, uh, no. Uh, go and take a smoke or something, Harry. Come back in 10 or 15 minutes, will you? Yeah, sure, Leo. Uh, you yell if you want me, huh? Yeah? Okay, Harry. Dear sir, today I've been to see Mr. Bill Morris of the Augusta Chronicle, who suggested that I write you. My husband, Lieutenant Colonel George Frederick Marshall was killed in action at Iran on November 8th. I've had no details whatsoever other than those in the enclosed articles written by your correspondent, Leo Disher. I realize that it is a great deal to ask, but I'm praying that you may be able to contact him, even though he may not have any more first-hand information. He's probably in a position to find out for me exactly what took place. When in time our two little boys are old enough to be told, they will be very proud, and I should so like to be able to answer their questions. It's a very dreadful thing, and not to know makes it just a little bit harder. If you can find out anything for me, I shall appreciate it more than I can tell. After reading Mrs. Marshall's letter, Leo Disher walked over to the window of his apartment and stood looking down at a quiet London park. He saw nurses wheeling baby carriages or stopping to talk to the policeman at the entrance. He saw a young man in an RAF uniform stop to light a cigarette. A young English girl in a WAPS uniform went by. 
She saluted the RAF officer, and they stood talking and laughing in front of Leo Disher's window overlooking the park. And all the time Disher looked out his window, he was hearing a voice. A voice that he had last heard during the attack on Iraq. Throw the grenades! Harry. Harry! Yeah, Leo. Can I do something for you? Yeah. I want to dictate a letter. Okay. Go ahead. It's to Mrs. George Frederick Marshall. Mm -hmm. Her address is in the letter on my desk. Right. Dear Mrs. Marshall. You got that? Sure. Uh, Oh, yes, of course you have. Sorry. This isn't going to be easy. Dear Mrs. Marshall. Oh, yes, you've got that. Mm -hmm. I believe, Mrs. Marshall, that I can help. When I got your letter this morning, I walked to the window and looked out over a quiet green park. Uh, a quiet green park. Oh, yes. But momentarily, I saw instead a night made hideous with flame and explosion. And I heard again a voice saying, throw the grenades. Yes, I saw your husband that morning when the black coast of Africa trembled. But it was not the first time I'd seen him. You're right this way, Mr. Disher. The captain will see you now, sir. The first time was at a British port when I boarded the cutter taking us to Oran. Good morning, Mr. Disher. Sit down, won't you? The others will be aboard directly. Two American officers entered the captain's cabin. One was lean and bronzed, almost too young for the colonel's insignia on his shoulders. Mr. Disher, I'd like to have you meet Colonel Marshall. How do you do, Mr. Disher? Hello. And uh, Lieutenant Cole of the United States Army. Glad to know you. How do you do? Now, make yourselves comfortable, gentlemen, uh, while I see that all your equipment is loaded aboard. If you don't mind, Captain, I'd like very much to go along with you. There are several details I'd rather look after personally. Why, certainly. Certainly, Colonel Marshall. Your husband spoke with a crisp authority that made me forget he was only 31. Later, I said to Lieutenant Cole... He seems awfully young for a colonel. Yeah, but he's one of the best. I'd follow him anywhere. I saw your husband again at Gibraltar, Mrs. Marshall. And later, as we pushed across the Mediterranean, he told me something about how he was graduated from West Point. Afterwards, a married, beautiful girl. And And how he had a wife and two boys back in the States. Here's a picture. Beautiful girl. Isn't she? And this, this is our oldest boy, Ricky. He's going on three now. (laughs) He's big for his age, isn't he? Yeah, he's a fine boy. We have another one now, six months old. I haven't got a picture of him yet. I imagine they'll be well when we get back from this raid. My wife says he looks just like me. <laughs> Poor kid. <laughs> we kept talking about back home until he had to go down to the wardroom to meet with other officers to work out final plans to break the boom at Oran Harbor. If you're ready, gentlemen. Now, this is our plan. The attack will begin at 0300. A British cruiser lying offshore will fire rockets to divert attention from us. And we'll go in and crash the harbor boom. Afterwards, we're to land and disrupt the harbor installation and capture any French vessels we can find at the dock. Now, is that clear? Uh, Questions, please. We aren't able to crash the boom. If that happens, gentlemen, a few prayers from all concerned would be of great assistance. (laughs) Now, seriously, I've just received a piece of information that may indicate more trouble than we had at first anticipated. Now, there's a cruiser-type warship in the harbor. Now, that means big guns and lots of them. Yes, quite. However, I have made a plan which may or may not work. If the cruiser fires on us when we're past the harbor boom, we'll board her with machine guns and grenades. If we can neutralize her fire in that manner, our mission will be successful. If not, God have mercy on us all. It was then I began to understand what he intended to do, Mrs. Marshall. We had been surprised to learn that there was a cruiser in the harbor. That meant there would be heavier guns than we expected. But the colonel calmly described his bold plan to board the enemy warship with grappling irons and to capture it with machine guns and grenades in order to clear the way for the American assault on the harbor. There's a paragraph in your letter, Mrs. Marshall, saying, you may not have first-hand information, but perhaps you can find out some of the details. Yes, I can tell some details. I remember how your husband climbed the ladder to the bridge just before the attack. He was carrying a Tommy gun under his arm. He stood beside me and pulled out his service automatic from his holster. Yeah, take this, Mr. Disher. If I need it later, I'll yell for it. Okay, Colonel. How are we doing, Captain? Well, about a mile and a half to go. Won't be long now. Our course is 055, standard number. Force 4, speed 12 knots. Think we can hold that? I don't know, Colonel. This is an awful tub, but our engineer assures us that our engines will get us to our destination. Very well. Carry on, Captain. 
Lieutenant Cole, get the men ready. Yes, sir. Uh, how much left rudder do we carry now, Cochin? Five degrees left rudder, sir. Steering base for zero five five. Hmm. Well, keep it at that. Quartermaster. Yes, sir. Have the range finder give us a hundred yard reading. Aye, aye, sir. Range finder, train on harbor and give hundred yard reading. Aye, aye. Is the public address system working, Captain? Why, yes, Colonel. The speaker's cut in. Men, go again now. Stand by, please, and wait for orders. You all know your assigned tasks. When I give the word, go in and do your job like soldiers. And may God bless you all. Range is now 1,400 yards. Next one, Both engines ahead! Oh! Approaching the boom. All men below deck lie down. You know the main facts of the story. How we plunged against the harbor boom, hoping the French wouldn't open fire, but they did. You know how we were trapped, how our ammunition began exploding, how the guns of the warships in the harbor raked our little ship. paragraph in your letter, Mrs. Marshall, that I read many times, saying, when in time our two boys are old enough to be told, they will be very proud, and I should so like to be able to answer all their questions. Yes, Mrs. Marshall, they will be very proud. And you can tell them their father was a slim, straight silhouette against the red flames of the guns. You can tell them that when he gave the order to throw the grenades to attack a warship with hand grenades. His voice was calm above the chatter of his machine gun. Stand by. Stand by to throw the grenades. Yes, sir. Captain, bring us alongside the cruiser. Get beneath the gun. We'll be blown out of the water. We'll be blown out if we don't go in. Bring us alongside, sir. Stand by! Boarding party is away. Throw the grenades. You can tell your sons, Mrs. Marshall, that their father kept stabbing back into the last while the flames of our burning ship broke around him and shells tore away pieces of the bridge where he stood, striking back against guns so close that, well, it almost seemed we could touch them. You need never fear the boys' questions, Mrs. Marshall. You can tell them that their father tackled a job of greatest importance to the success of our armies and that he never quit fighting against impossible odds and that he never struck the ship's colors. I'm glad Bill Morris suggested that you write to me, and I hope this letter may help a little. But it's wrong for you to say you're asking a great deal of me, Mr. Marshall. You are the one of whom a great deal was asked, and proudly given. You and a great many others at home. Yours sincerely, Leo Disher. Leo Disher is one of a corps of United Press correspondents whose privilege it is to record the heroic deeds of our fighting men on the war fronts. In fulfillment of this assignment, these soldiers of the press share the dangers of soldiers in arms. And because in our democratic way of life, war correspondents do see at first hand the actions they report, the free peoples of the world are today the best informed. We will be back next week with another program of Soldiers of the Press. Be sure to listen. And meanwhile, listen to United Press News on the air. Look for United Press dispatches in your favorite newspaper. They are your guarantee of the world's best coverage of the world's biggest news. <laughs>